dear to me the silent place in the heart of hearts ever where time began begins and will begin ever dear to me the silent place amid the holy mother of oceans in the land of souls where the gates of the world await whoever dares them oh may that primary silence be the source of the voice in me that i raise now in the name of the maker of all i make reverence to the ancestors and to the spirits of the unborn as i begin may it bring good to whomsoever may hear it this teaching tale from ancient ireland this tale from the magic lord of erin this tale of the deeds of the tuatha de danann Three times in the hand of the creator Erin put on a coat of forests from shore to shore Three times in the hand of God a coat of moors moss and stones A thousand and a thousand years before our first four fathers were ever dreamed there were awake in Erin the fear bolg the people of the leather bag the earth of tussocks hummocks hillocks and hills was bagged and carried by the fear bolg in the making of fields and over the five parts of erin they held sovereignty by the strength of their own hand and by the sweat of their brow but about erin in the islands of the sea and among the islands with their ships and even some said beneath the ever reaching waves in magic strongholds in lands below the waters there lived the sea people the favorig some said the favorig had one eye to each of them one leg one hand three rows of sharp teeth this truth i tell you they had an eye to see what they might plunder their pace was of one step only to steal their reach only to take and their grasp rapacious the favorig imposed tribute upon the fear bolg and this they took every autumn at halloween the eve of sawain this tribute they took two thirds of the grain of erin two thirds of the milk cows and two thirds of the children as slaves and surely the favorig were as versed in magic as they were feared as warriors shape changers they could be and casters of spells and most powerful among hosts of powerful champions and lords of the favorig most feared of all was the giant baller baller of the baleful eye for what was prated about the one-eyed sea people found a truth in baller for though one of his eyes was just like any the other had an eyelid so heavy he could not raise it himself but the lid being pierced with a ring of bronze ten men with ropes would raise it as required whosoever that i beheld would perish at once and so fear of baller's baleful eye and of the might of the favorig held the fear bolg in servitude but such tribute as the fear bolg paid was arduous for the favorig to collect the fear bolg were not to be subdued entirely for they too were strong warriors cunning schooled in hatred and very numerous with heavy hard-edged death-dealing weapons and the high hills behind them where the favorig had only the waters of the sea an uneasy balance sustained between the fear bolg and the favorig now there lived at this time in the magic realm known as the great north the tuatha de danann the people of art and skill these were beings of such power and beauty they were like gods in many ways this is the truth of it 
the Fir Bolog, the Favorik, and the Tuahadidanen were our forefathers in spirit, and were beings of power in the days before humans were born into the world at all. The Tuahadidanen had learned druidry and high magic in the four cities of the Great North, in the four cities of instruction. In Phalias, city of the stone, Phalias, city of the teacher Morphiza, the most wise. In Gorius, city of the spear, Gorius, city of the teacher Esrus, the most wise. In Findius, city of the sword, Findius, the city of the teacher Uskius, the most wise. And in Murius, city of the cauldron, Murius, city of the teacher Semius, the most wise. Nuida was king of the Tuahedadanen then. He brought the sword of Findius out of Findius. If it were unsheathed, it would taste blood. If it were unsheathed, it would take life. The Doida was high druid of the Tuahedadanen then. His name, one name of the many names he had, his name, the Doida, means the good God, for he was at one with the Creator. The Doida had the harp, Dar Doblo. It would call forth the seasons in their order. The Doida brought the cauldron of Murius out of Murius. None that came to it ever left unsatisfied, for it was a cauldron of inspiration. It was a cauldron of instruction. The other treasures of the great north, the stone of Phalius and the spear of Gorius, are to be found in this tale also, as I will tell when their time will come. Now it came to pass that the Doida and Nuida the king took counsel with the Tuahedidanen. They found it favourable to muster their numbers and set sail for Erin. <laughs> They landed in Ulster on the day of Baltina, the first day of May. They burned their ships upon the shore. These terms they offered to the fear bollog. Yield to us one half of Erin, or prepare to fight. Oki Mokerk, king of the fear bollog, and high king of Erin at this time, sent his chief poet to the Tuatha de Danann. This he asked of them, How do you suggest this battle be fought? Is it for one day? Is it of single combats? Nuida made this reply. What we propose is a fight of equal numbers. The battle will continue till you yield or till we are dead. This was heavy news for the Fearbolog, for they greatly outnumbered their enemy. Yet they drew up their forces with wooden ramparts before them, wooden posts and stakes, wooden props. For this reason the field was called Moitura, Field of Props, near Kong to the north of Loch Corrib. It was at midsummer the agreed first day of battle dawned at Moitura, and in that first day's fighting the Tuahedidanan were driven back. At sunset the Fearbolog made a celebratory cairn of severed heads. Upon the second day of fighting, as many more were killed, banished from the joy of life and from the light of the sun, Nuida, king of the Tuahedidanen, was carried wounded from the field, his right arm hacked from his shoulder by the sword of the Fearbolog warrior, Srang. It was thus that on the third day the Tuahedidanen were led by the Doida, and the slaughter of that day was greater than the days that preceded it, as the sea is greater than the river. 
a day for lamentation, painted with the red and with the dark blood. One hundred thousand of the fear Bolog were slain, with their king, Okimokerk. So, upon the fourth day of fighting, the fear Bolog that were yet alive resolved to die, if need be. And they made such furious onslaught, led by Sreng, that the Tuahadidanan called at last for parley. They offered Sreng whatever fifth of Erin he would choose, and Sreng chose Connaught. The fear bullock were there henceforward, except for those who had fled before, beyond the seas, to their old enemies, the Favoric. These fear bullock settled in the Isle of Man, in Arran, in Isla, and in Rachlin. <laughs> There now fell a disagreement between the women of the Tuahedidanen and the men as to who should be the new king over them. For they had a law, the Tuahedidanen, that none could rule who was maimed in any limb. The loss of his right arm at Moitura debarred Nuada from the throne. Some numbers of the people favoured the warrior Bress as royal successor. He had fought most bravely against the fear Bolog, but though his mother was of the Tuahedidanen, his father was a king of the Favorig, and none knew what this might portend. Some hoped such kinship would be advantageous to the Tuahedidanen in forming an alliance with the Favorig, thus putting an end to their depredations and to their marauding in Erin. I will tell you at this time why Erin is a name for Ireland. I will tell you now about the mother of Bress. The land of Ireland, a place in the world we know, is also, like this tale, a place in the mind and a place in the spirit. Ireland has the name Erin in the mouth of song and upon the tongue of legend, for one reason and for one reason alone. It is named after Eru, mother of Bress. The Tuahedidanen had the power sometimes to become the physical vehicles of great forces in the spirit. As the Doida was at one with the great creator, so Eru and her sisters Banva and Fola were the human incarnations of the spirit of Ireland herself. I will relate how it was that Bress came to be born. One day... One sunny day, when the bees were murmuring about the petals of the white roses and the pink roses, Eru sat alone, gazing out over the waters of the sea. A sea glass green and calm as glass. A vessel of silver appeared below the sky. It seemed a ship of great size yet indistinct and moving with neither wind nor oar, one man on board alone, a fine man indeed, a fine man that stepped ashore. Yellow hair to his shoulders in curls, his cloak embroidered, his shirt with gold thread, a brooch of gold with gems, two shining spears bronze shafted, five circlets of bright gold about his neck, his sword gold-hilted with silver inlaid with gold. He said to Eru, Shall I have an hour of love with you? I certainly have made no tryst with you, said Eru. 
without tryst then. They lay together. Eru wept tears when the man rose to his feet again. Why are you weeping tears, he said. Two things I lament, said Eru. Firstly, for that the young men of my people have been courting me so long in vain while you now possess me so. And secondly, I lament to part from you at all, however we have met. He gave her a gold ring from his middle finger, saying, Give it again, only to one whose finger it will fit. Tell me your name, said Eru. Elaha, king of the Favorig, has come to you, he said. You will bear a son, and let no name be given to him but Bress, Bress the Beautiful. From the day of the boy's birth, every beautiful thing will be compared to him. Field and fortress, ale and candle, woman and man and horse. Bress was the name given to that baby at his birth, as Elaha had directed. Within one week he grew the growth of two weeks, and so he grew till by the age of seven he had the growth of fourteen years. Beautiful the young man Bress was, certainly, and now it came to pass that the kingship of the land was given him. Little joy came of it, for Bress the Beautiful had weakness in him for terrible greed. As soon as he became king, he made alliance with the Favorig, and not at all as the Tuahedidanen had wished, for by flattering inducements... Messengers of the Favorig played upon the weakness of Bress and imposed tribute upon Erin through the kingship of Bress as well as by their own power. Tribute such that no wisp of smoke from any roof in Erin was left untaxed. The power of the Favorig fell upon Erin heavier than ever. The champions and nobles of the Tuahedidanan were reduced to servitude. The Doida himself became merely a builder of ramparts and ditch fortifications for Bress. Sorrow and poverty and heavy burden, such was the fortune of the Tuahedidanan then. The Doida was not happy in his work. But the Doida had a son, Ingus, called the Mok Ok, the young son, for he had been conceived and born in one night. The boy's mother was of the people of the She, the people of the other world. And Angus the Mok Ok was gifted with the power of far seeing, and his was the vision that helped his people now. He spoke secretly to his father, saying, Soon you will finish your labours. Ask this for your wages only, to view the cattle of Erin, to choose but one. Choose then the small, sprightly, black-coated, black-maned young cow that has never borne a calf. That young heifer only. Remember my words, my father, for this choice will be of the greatest worth to us long years from now. Give me that young heifer into my keeping, for I will keep her safe, out of time entirely, among my mother's people, among the she, until we have need of her. All this time, Bress held power. He could not be required to abdicate while the former and rightful king, Nuida, yet lived, debarred from kingship for lack of his arm. Bress was a man with no hospitality, no generosity befitting a king. Of all the wealth he had, he would share nothing. When the Tuahedidanan visited him, their knives were not greased by him, No matter how often they came to him at the royal palace of Tara, their breath 
did not ever smell of ale. No harpers, pipers, hornblowers, jugglers, nor fools were to be found in the royal household. Nor did any see contests in arts of peace or war. No warriors at all were to be seen about Tara in the time of Bress, except for Ogma, the great champion of the Tuahadidanan. And this was all the task he had, to gather firewood among the islands of Clue Bay. Yet worst of all, was this. Bards were no longer honoured at Tara. Carabra himself, chief bard of the Tuahetidanen. Carabra, making his travels about the country as usual, Carabra came in due course to the court of Bress. The quarters he was offered were not fitting at all. A mean, narrow room with neither fire nor furniture not even a bed. For food he was given three small oat cakes, bannocks from the day before. Dry indeed was his repast. Carabra left at first light, and he was not thankful. These words he spoke then. Food to his table, sparse and late, wood wide about the plate, his cellar dry to him as he left me, his best drink skim, milk stolen from the calf. No laughter of guests, by firelight and by day his riches half, and again half, till he has not enough even to pay. A storyteller, let this be my parting gift to Bress. This was the first satire ever made in Erin, and it put a blight on Bress that made his luck dwindle from him without delay. Now at last a new stroke of fortune enabled the Tuahadidanen to demand the abdication of Bress, to replace Nuada on the throne as the rightful king. Since Nuada's arm had been cut off at Moitura, the healer Jan Kecht, the great healer of the Tuahadidanen, had made for Nuada an artificial limb of silver, a work of wonder and skill indeed that moved in all its joints as well as the arm and hand of any alive. But still it was a limb of metal, an infirmity which debarred Nuida from the kingship. However, Jan Kecht had a son, Miach, whose skill was greater than his father's. Miach knew that the silver limb was built around the original bones of the lost arm, so Miach now took the arm of silver from Nuida and spoke to it, saying, Joint to joint, sinew to sinew. Three days he carried the arm against the skin of his own body, bound to his chest. The silver fell away, and the arm bones and finger bones took on a covering of flesh and of skin. Three days more, Miach carried the arm of Nuida near to his own heart's warmth, and the warmth of Miach went into the arm. Miach replaced the arm on Nuida, and for three days more cast at the arm wisps of brown bulrushes that had been scorched in flame. Till on the last of the nine days the arm of Nuida was restored and whole as well as ever it had been in his life, so that there was now no longer any flaw or blemish with him at all. Miach was not rewarded for his skill. His father, Jan Kecht, fell into a fury of jealousy. He struck a sword blow at his son and cut the crown of Miach's head, skin and flesh. But Miach healed himself of that at once. Jan Kecht struck again at Miach, flesh to bone, and Miach again healed himself. Even the third blow 
me a healed when he was wounded to the membrane of the brain. But the fourth blow Jan Kecht struck, cut Mirch's brain, and Mirch died. From the grave of Mirch, herbs grew green and flourished. 365 herbs, according to the position and number of his body's bones and parts, according to their power to heal, in their order and in their kind. Mirch's sister, Aramid, gathered the herbs into her spread cloak in their exact positions as they had grown. But Jankecht came and scattered and scuffed the herbs with his foot, so that none after would know their true use unless they were guided directly by holy inspiration. Jankecht said these words then, as the bards relate. Though Miach be dead, Aramid shall remain. The Tuahadidanan deposed Bress now, making Nuada High King of Erin once more, and thus ending the Treaty of Tributes that Bress had agreed with the Favorig. Bress now gave up the kingship, but if he did, he was unwilling, and intended to keep no promise he might make. When he left the palace that had been his, the court of the High King, the Palace of Tara, Bress took with him his own followers, and all the treasure they could carry, and Bress stole Dar Dobla, the harp of the Doida, whose music empowered the seasons in their order. So from the time the harp was stolen, no season came forth in its full vigour or flourish. The Doida knew the modes and fingerings for each incantation of the year, but the magic of Dar Dobla, the power of the harp itself, was required to call the seasons. And so with the harp stolen, one day followed another with grey skies, foggy, rainy days, and cloudy. Well, Bress now went to his mother, Eru, and inquired of her regarding his father, whose name was unknown to him and whom he had never met, although he knew his father was a chieftain of the Favorig. My son, I have a sure way for you, she said. She gave him the magic ring Elaha had given to her. It fitted perfectly upon the middle finger of Bress, for it had been so made by the will of Elaha to fit none other but Bress after Eru. By the power of that ring, Bress and Eru and all their company were born at once into the presence of Elaha among the Favorig. These words Elaha said to Bress, I see by the ring you wear you are my son. What forced you out of the sovereignty of Erin? Nothing, nothing at all, was the answer Bress gave back to him. Nothing but my own rule, which they would not endure, for I deprived them not only of valuables, but of necessities and status. Better their requests than their curses, said Elaha. Better their prosperity than the loss of your kingship. Why have you come to me? I have come to ask for an army of warriors, and a fleet of ships. You should not seek to retake by alliance what you cannot keep by your own hand. What advice do you have for me then? said Bress. Leave the harp of the Doida in my keeping. I will place such spells upon it that the Doida will never find it unless I lift the spells myself again. Bress, you must go to seek the aid of Boller. Baller of the Baleful Eye. He will raise all the Favorig against the Tuahadidanan in full war. 
So it was that Bress sought aid of Baller, and so it was that Baller assembled a mighty fleet of sleek, bright-sailed, many-oared ships, enough to make a bridge of ships from the Hebrides to Erin, and Baller called together all the hosts of the Favorig to make ready for war. For Baller, you see, had one weakness in all his power. It had been long foretold that he would never be killed at all till he was killed by his own grandson. So he had kept his only child, his daughter, Enya, locked in a tower of brass on Tory Island, that no man might come near her or even see her. But in spite of all precaution it had so chanced that Cian of the two-headed Annan had fathered a son upon Enya and had stolen the babe away to Erin as the bards relate. There the babe was fostered and raised. He grew as Bress had grown, twice as fast as another child, because, like Bress, he was partly of the Favorig. Bress the Beautiful had grown strong but greedy and weak to be flattered, but this child grew strong, you may be sure, but he grew skilled in every art. The name he was given was Lu Love Fada, Lu Long Hand, for he could turn his hand to anything. He had the title Ildenach, All Skilled. <laughs> Lulov Fada grew to be a man with the youth of youth in him and the strength of life rising in him from the heels of his feet to the crown of his head with mastery of the arts of peace and war. came to him then on the first day of August. Three women, cloaked with cloaks of raven feathers, hooded black cloaks about them, such that their faces could not be seen. They gave to Lu Lov Fada the long spear they were carrying. These words they spoke to him then. This is the spear of Gorias, which we have kept in our keeping for you, for you alone can wield it. Lu Lov Fada, Ildenach, it is your destiny now to make your way to Tara. So Lu Love Fada took the spear, and the destiny, and the road to Tara, to the court of Nuada, High King of Erin. Who is at the gate of Tara? These words the gatekeeper called out. Lu Love Fada is here. Tell me, Lu Love Fada, what art or skill do you practice? For none may enter Tara, none may enter the courts of the people of art, unless they bring new craft or understanding to our company. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a worker of wood. We need you not. We have a wood worker already. Luchta, wise as the trees. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a worker of metal. We do not need you. We have a smith already, Guivnu, and we have column of the three new techniques. We have also the brass worker, Credney. Question me, gatekeeper. 
I am a champion. We need you not. We have a champion already. Ogma, sunny face, the eloquent, the honey-mouthed, a great hurler of stones. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a harper. We do not need you. We have a harper already. Abkan, whom the men of the three gods chose in the she mounds. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a warrior. We need you not. We have a warrior. Bressel Mukechdach, a big warrior. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a poet and history keeper. We do not need you at all. We have Enmak, Olav of Erin, a creel of verse. Question me, gatekeeper. I am skilled in all magic and druidry. We need you not. We have the Dida and Fichol and numerous other male and female wizards, sorcerers, soothsayers, horse whisperers and wart charmers. We are drifting with them. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a healer. We do not need you. We have a healer already, Jan Kecht, and you don't want to get in his road, I'll tell you that for nothing. Question me, gatekeeper. I am a cup-bearer. We need you not. We have already about the place a sufficient sufficiency of clean, swift, pure, dew-bright cup-bearers. Ask, O gatekeeper, ask of the wise in Tara, whether they have one skilled in all these arts. When Nuada the king heard of the skills of Lu Lov Fada, he ordered that he be made welcome to Tara. It was now to test Lu Lov Fada within the walls of Tara, each man and woman of power arose in their turn, and in every skill that he professed, Lu Lov Fada proved himself to them with sure mastery. And so at last Nuida arose from his throne, and spoke these words to Lu Lov Fada, saying, We know that the Favorig are mustering hosts and fleets to conquer our people for the sake of Bress. It is certain that you are the man of all skills whose arrival has been foretold by those who have the sight. I offer to you the sovereignty of the land. Be our king and leader at this time of peril. These words Lu Lav Fada said then to Nuida. What advice do you have for me? And Nuida said, Order as king that all the Tuahadidanan gather here at Tara, and inquire of them what power they will wield for us now against the Favoric. This was done. And when all were gathered, Lu Lav Fada inquired of them, saying, Women and men of the Tuahedidanan, what power do you wield for us now against the Favoric? Each in their turn made answer. Warriors, smiths, champions, healers, poets and musicians. Lu Lav Fada asked the sorcerer Magin what power he would wield for his part. He made this reply. I will unsettle the mountains of Erin beneath the feet of the Favorig. I will make the hills steep and unpassable against them. Schlieve League and Denda Ulla, the mountains of Morn, Bri Erigi, Schlieve Bloom, Snacht of the snow, Slemish Blasliev and Nevin Mountain, Schlieve Maku and Belgadon, the Curlew Hills and Cropatric. Lulav Fada asked the cupbearers what power they would wield against the Favorig. Thirst we will give to them, they said. 
the twelve chief lochs of Erin we will make dry to them. Loch Derg, Loch Limni, Loch Corrib, Loch Ri, Loch Mask, Strangford Loch, Belfast Loch, Loch Ne, Loch Foil, Loch Gara, Loch Re, and Mar Loch. And we will hide the twelve chief rivers of Erin from the eyes of the Favorig, so that never a drop will they find of them. The bush, the boin, the barn, the black water, the lee, the shannon, the moy, the sligo, the ern, the fin, the liffy, and the shure. Now Fichal the druid spoke, saying, Three showers of fire I will rain upon the faces of the Favorig. I will take from them two-thirds of their courage, strength, and skill. I will bind the urine in their bodies and in the bodies of their horses. But every breath that we breathe will fortify our courage, strength, and skill, though we fought seven years long and weary we would remain. The Doida now put into action a plan of his own. He went to visit the Mother of Terror, the Raven of Battle, the Morrigu. Now the Morrigu was the daughter of Irnvas Iron Death, the most famous female warrior of the Tuatha Dé Danann in her time. Irnvas was the daughter of Nuada. Irnvas Iron Death was killed in the Battle of Moitura when her people took Erin from the Fyrbolg, and since the death of her mother, the Morgu and her two sisters, Macha and Bav, had become the incarnations of the spirit of death and warfare. Doida met the Morrigu at the Inchin of Corin. This question he asked of her. At what landing place will the Favorig land in Erin, and where should we seek battle? The Morrigu loosened nine tresses of her hair, and folding her cloak of raven feathers about her, this answer she gave back to him. They will land at Shkena, where the first people landed in Erin, at the beginning of all. We should seek battle at Moitura, but not the Moitura near Kong, where we fought the Fear Bolog, but at the Moitura near Slago. And what price will you require for this that you tell me? This question the Doida asked of the Morrigu then. Only this, my sweet man, was the answer she gave back to him. All the heart's blood of Indech, king of the Favorig, and the blood of his kidneys, the blood of his valour, the blood of his warriors to the last drop. All the blood spilt at Moitura will be the price of my reward. These words the Morrigu spoke then, as the bards relate. I am she who stands among the fallen, I am she who shall pursue what she has sighted. I am she who has the power of death. I am she who knows the ways of taking life.
The Doida made his way then to the place where the Favorig were gathering, to the place of which the Morgu had told him. The Doida wanted to get some idea of where Brest might have concealed his harp, Dar Dobla. It seemed to be shielded by magic from every spell he could raise to find it. He wanted to get an idea of the numbers of the Favorig, or any help that might be of use. His guise, however, as he went to meet the Favorig, was not handsome. A moth-eaten plaid about his shoulders, a short kilt of grey-brown wool about his buttocks, and as naked of all other clothes as any beggar man, save only for shoes of horse skin on his feet, the hairy side out. His druid staff, of which one tip brought death to the living and the other tip brought life to the dead, his druid staff he trailed in the mud behind him as he walked. It left a track like a boundary ditch. He announced his name to the gatekeepers of the Favorig. They laughed to see this famous and noble druid of the Tuahadid Annan, so humble and tattered. The Doida asked Indech, king of the Favorig, regarding Dar Doblo, saying, Where has Bress concealed my harp of power? It is where you will not be getting it, was all the answer the Doida could obtain. The Favorig decided to make a mock of the Doida. It was well known that he was fond of porridge, so they decided to make him some. They filled for him the cauldron of Indech. They thought the royal vessel would be large enough. Eight score gallons of fresh milk and eight score gallons of meal and fat they poured into it. Whole carcasses of goat, mutton and pork. They boiled and poured the lot steaming into a deep hole in the ground. And Indech said to the Doida then, You will be executed unless you finish all this fine porridge we have made for you. We would have you eat your fill, lest you make satires upon the hospitality of the Favorig. The Doida took his own ladle out of his pouch, a ladle large enough for a man and a woman to lie together in. He ladled up some of the porridge and peered at it with interest. These are the bits that were in his ladle, halves of salt pork and a quart of lard. The Doida sniffed with every sign of relish, saying, This is good food if its taste is like its smell. When he put the ladle into his mouth, he smiled, saying, It's a wise man who understands that the poor bits do not spoil it. He ate without pause, then, till at last he scraped his bent finger over the bottom of the hole among the earth and gravel, closed his eyes, and fell asleep, snoring loudly, his belly swollen and bloated with porridge. The Favorig laughed at the Doida and made jokes about the size of his belly. When the Doida woke at last, he was allowed to go his way. He left amid general merriment. It was not easy for him to walk at all, with the weight he was carrying. <laughs> As the Doida was going along his way, he met a young woman, a very beautiful woman, and young. He desired her, for lust was ever an appetite with him as great as his hunger. But he was at this time in no condition for any dalliance on account of his gut full of porridge. 
This, moreover, was no ordinary young woman, as the Doida soon found out. She seized him in a wrestler's grip and sank him up to his buttocks in the earth. Angrily he said to her, Why have you heaved me out of my road? You will carry me, she replied, you will carry me upon your back to my father's dwelling place. What is your father's name? Indech, king of the Favorig. And with these words she struck the doida with a blow that caused the entire contents of his belly to disgorge themselves at once by the high road and the low. You will carry me now upon your back, or I will sing satires against you. I am under a magic forbiddance in that, he said. I may not carry anyone unless they call me by my right name. I know your name, she said. You are the Doida. That is my title, not my name. What is your name? Fair Ben. Carry me, Fair Ben. That is not my full name. What is it then? Fair Ben Bruach. Carry me, Fair Ben Bruach. That also is not my name correctly. What is the entire completeness of your name for calling you as yourself in full, without omission, error, slip, or concealment? This name he told her, she called him now, saying, Fair Ben, man of the horn, fool for a woman, lively for the age of him, Fair Ben, swollen belly bag, scorned outcast, muddy labourer, Fair Ben, man of the mountain, staff-bearer, mound-maker, paid with one cow, instructed in the four cities, keeper of the cauldron of Murius, all-father, lord of the grove, lord of the animals, harper of the seasons, master of the three chariots of war, true wheel, full circle of meaning, spirit of kingliness, at one with the most lowly, at one with the most high, crowned with stag horn, tongued with leaves of the high trees, sage of the lights of heaven, knowledge of waters, rebirth of the world. Not all the names she called him can now be understood. Not all the names she called him can be spoken at all. He clambered to his feet then, and hoisted the girl onto his back. But it was not to Indech he carried her, but to the place called Beltra Strand. The signs of their coupling can be seen to this day upon the earth. Afterwards, these words she said to him, You will not go to the battle. Certainly I will go, he said. You will not go, she said, for I will be a stone at the mouth of every ford you will cross. It will not keep me, for I will tread on every stone. The mark of my heel will be on every stone forever. You will not pass me, for I will be a giant oak in every river crossing and in every pass. I will indeed pass you on my way to the battle, and the mark of my axe will be on every oak forever. These words she said then. When the Favorig gather for battle against you and your people, I myself will sing spells against them. I will practice the deadly art of the wand against them, and I alone will make combat against a ninth part of the host. All this time, the hosts of the Favorig were landing in their thousands and tens of thousands upon the shores of Erin. The warriors of Indech, of Terra, of Elaha, and of Balor joined with Bress and his followers, and all together went forward to Moitura. Outnumbered as they were, 
The Tuathedidanan had surely prepared with smithcraft, wizardry, and guile, and their healer Jan Kecht and Aramid his daughter had made a well of cure, the well called Sloina, such that the wounded of their people, though they might be near their death, were, as soon as they were dipped in the waters of Sloina, able to walk from the well in the fire of their full vigour, healed of their wounds. Yet, how vastly the Favorig outnumbered the Tuahedidanen, and the Favorig were themselves full ready, not only with helmet, spear, shield and sword, but also with wizardry and witchcraft of their own. To attack the Favorig in that conflict was like striking one's head against a rock face, like placing one's hand in a nest of adders, like holding one's cheek against the living coals of a forge. Boller of the baleful eye strode through the field of battle, strewing death to left and to right of him, like a scythe man mowing hay. Boller was seeking to kill his grandson, Lou Love Fada. He had as yet kept his eye of power closed, and with sword alone was killing all before him, seeking ever for the one he had to kill. On that fatal day, Boller killed Nuada, and Boller killed Macha, the great female warrior, daughter of Irnvas and sister of the Morigu. Lu Lov Fada stepped forward from the warriors of his people. He stood upon his right leg, raised his right arm, closed his right eye, and shouted with a shout that would be heard as well by the rising sun or by the setting sun in all the islands of the world, saying, Arotroi! Battle come afire! Foe, foe! Fe, fe! Clay! Amen, she! Bollard of the baleful eye spoke then, saying, That is the voice of my grandson and no other. Raise up my eyelid that I may gaze his death upon him. Ten men of the Favorig now with ropes began to raise the eyelid of the baleful eye. But the Morigu put a casting stone into the hand of Lul Love Fada, a casting stone called a Talav, as the bards relate. A Talav, heavy, kiln-hardened, she gave him, a casting ball to blind the eye of Baller. Of the blood of five ferocious animals, this talav of war was composed. With the blood of dragons, mixed with the brains of heroes, the sand of the ocean of the east, the sand of the ocean of the west, were in the deadly talav fired with the brains of kings. This was the one weapon that could bring an end to Boller. Lu Lov Fada cast sure the talav, driving the eye of Boller, his grandfather, in blood and flinders from the backbone of his head, the power of Boller with it, and the last of his life also. The death of Boller turned the tide of battle against the Favorig, and the Morgu then spread wide her cloak of raven feathers and called forth the deepest venom of war in fullest fury against them. And Lulav Fada and the Doida and the Morgu and Ogma led their people in a final onslaught against their enemies. Fine fighters fell there where death was tended, honour and shame side by side where death was nurtured. Fire of anger and its quenching, red plenteous rills, blood over white skin, mangled by the victorious, the youthful dead. Not sweet the noise of sword on sword, harsh music, screams of warriors, clashing of bright shields, hiss of sharp bone-hilted blades, rattle of arrows, 
hum and whir of swung spears, of thrown spears, scythe slicing, axe cleaving hammer strokes, of piercing weapons. Hand edge, finger edge, white bone, torn flesh, foot beside foot, falling they were from the slipperiness of blood wet ground. Heads swept away, the dead sat, rolled, lay still. Sharpness was there, wounding, disemboweling and dismemberment. Red hafted the spears in the hands of foes. But in the hand of Lu Love Fada, the spear of Gorius quenched its own thirst at the fount of blood. Blood streamed from that spearhead as a mountain stream gushes by both sides of a rock. The Favorig were put to flight. Only the wounded and the dead remained. And of those who died at Moitura, these words Lu Love Fada spoke as the bards relate. Until the stars of heaven can be counted, sands of the sea, flakes of snow, the dew on the grass, grasses under horse hoof, hailstones under the hooves of herds of horses, the horses of the sun of the sea, the waves of every storm in the life of the world. Until these shall be counted, the slain at Moitura shall never be counted at all. The Favorig were vanquished. Those that survived fled to the sea. Loch Halfgreen, the chief bard of the Favorig, gave solemn vow that Erin would be preserved forever from the raids of the Favorig and from the payment of all tribute to the Favorig forever. All who had been in slavery to the Favorig were made free again. Bress, however, was captured. Bress was brought before the Tuatha de Danann. But his father, Elaha, was no longer alive, and the harp of the Doida could still not be found, for only Elaha had the spells of its concealment and of its unconcealment. But Ogma, the champion, now brought forward a magic sword, a sword he had taken as a prize of war. It was the sword which had belonged to Terra, lord of the Favorig. It was the nature of this sword that when it was unsheathed and cleaned, it would begin to speak of its deeds and of the deeds of heroes and to answer questions. It was this sword which revealed to the Tuatha de Danann the nature of the spells of concealment laid upon the Doida's harp by Elaha, father of Bress. With this knowledge, the Doida was enabled to call his harp back to him. And in gratitude to the Sword of Terra, all sharp-edged tools and weapons have ever since been entitled to cleaning and care. The Doida called to his harp, saying, Come, Dar Dabla, oak of two greennesses, frame of melody, Bringer of summer, bringer of winter, voice of music in all instruments. And Dar Dobla appeared in the air before him. The Doida cradled his harp in his arms. And the Doida stretched his fingers on the strings and played the modes of laughter, tears, and rest. 
He played the modes that called forth the seasons of the year in their full vigour and order as they were first made by the hand of God without flaw, without error, without restraint. The blue bells of spring, the singing birds of May, scroll-headed bracken, summer's briar rose, fresh meadow grass, the apple of September, hazels, snow upon sea beaches on the crisp days of winter, rain of sweetness, the rising moon and the pure and healing sun. And the doida drew the stone of power out of Phalias, the stone given now to the Tuahadidanan by the teacher Morfeza, the stone called Leofal, the stone of destiny. It would shout beneath the foot of a true king to make him known, that none like Bress should ever rule again. Lulov Fada set his foot upon the stone, and Leofal shouted with a shout that could be heard in every part of Erin, in every quarter of the air, in the high and the low mountains, and in every plain. It was now in the power and at the discretion of the Tuahadidanan to execute Bress for his treachery. But Bress said, Better to spare me than to kill me. What if we spare you? said Lu Love Fada to Bress. I will tell you a secret of the Favorig, a secret that will bring your fields to harvest in spring, in summer, in autumn and in winter, four harvests in each year. But the Tuahadidanan made him this reply, saying, We do not require your secret. The old way has always suited us, as the bards relate. Spring to plough and sow, young summer for strengthening the grain, young autumn for ripening it and reaping it, and winter for consuming it. Your secret does not save you, said Lu Love Fada to Bress. But answer us this question with truth, and your life will be spared. On what day of the week should the men of Erin plough? On what day sow? And on what day you reap? And Bress made this reply. On Tuesday plough. On Tuesday sow. On Tuesday reap. By this answer, and by this answer alone, Bress obtained his reprieve. For the sake of this answer, his life was spared. Angus the Mock Ock, son of the Doida, came forward then with birds of every colour flying before him and beside him as he walked, and with nine flowers of strength braided into his hair. He brought with him the small, sprightly, black-coated, black-maned young cow, the young heifer that the doida had been paid as wages for the work he had done for Bress. And all the cattle that had been taken from the Tuatha de Danann by the Favorig followed the young heifer out of the places of the Favorig and back into Erin. And as the doida's young heifer began to low, the cattle of Erin began to graze. In the name of the One, from whom all things begin, and in whom all things end, I make an end. May it bring great good to whomsoever may take heed of it. This tale of the deeds of the Tuatha de Danann and of the two battles of Moitura, this tale of instruction from the cauldron of Murius.
Thank you.